series. Uh, my name is Swat Joseph. I'm the founding director of the Middle East South Asia Studies Program. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Huda Sutta. But I, before I do that, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about our program. The program was founded in 2004. Uh, and since then, we've grown from being an undergraduate minor to becoming a major in 2008. And last year, we uh, were able to develop uh, three new minors, so that now we have four minors that one can specialize in in the program. We have a minor simply in Middle East South Asia studies, we have a minor in Arab studies, we have a minor in Iran uh, and Persian studies, and we have a, a minor in India South Asia studies. And that all, that all became effective last year. We're also in the process of developing a track in cinema studies. We already have a course in Iranian cinema, and we've just submitted a course in South Asian cinema, Turkish cinema, and Arab cinema. So pretty soon we'll have four courses, and students will be able to take a track in cinema studies, within Middle East South Asia studies. We're just very thrilled that we're able to offer all of these opportunities for students to know the history, the culture, the civilization, the languages, and the literatures of this, uh, this very important area of the world. We couldn't have done this without the community, and we couldn't have this uh, lecture series without the community. So I want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Jerry Said, who donated the funds not only to fund this uh, lecture series, but he funded much of our course development in, uh, in Arab studies. And through his contributions, we have now founded an endowment for Arab studies. Uh, and we're slowly building that endowment so that eventually we'll be able to bring in visiting professors to come spend a quarter or a year. Um, maybe we'll bring Dr. Hood back to once that endowment uh, fills itself out. Uh, if you'd like to know any more about the program, please visit our website or come and see me or uh, see our staff person, who, uh, the squishy man who's standing out, outside. <coughs> So it's my pleasure this evening to welcome uh, Dr. Asada. Dr. Asada and I have known each other now for at least 15 years, if not longer. Uh, she's a professor of English and Comparative Literature at, the, at Cairo University. Uh, she had previously been in an endowed chair at the uh, University of Manchester in England. And uh, for this year, she is the Carnegie Visiting Scholar at Georgetown University, where she is working on a book on her experience on the Constitutional Assembly, writing the Constitu new Constitution of Egypt, which she will be talking about this evening. She co-founded uh, and edited uh, Agar, an interdisciplinary, an interdisciplinary journal in women's studies, which is in Arabic. She's a member. She was a member of the 50-person committee, one of the five women, right, who drafted the Egyptian constitution that was endorsed through a referendum in uh, 2014, just uh, barely a year ago. She co-founded and is currently the chairperson of the Board of Trustees of the Women in Memory Forum, which I would say is probably the leading feminist research institution in the Arab world. It's really a model for how one builds a feminist research institution from the ground up. Uh, it's been in existence for 20 years, and I think it's probably the strongest single feminist research institution in the region. Uh, she's a board member. Uh, she was a former president of the Association for Middle East Women's Studies and is a member of its journal, which is called the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies. She's been a board member of the Global Fund for Women, which is uh, based in San Francisco. She's a member of the Arab Families Working Group, who we've worked together for 15 years in the Arab Families Working Group, which was founded in 2001. She was also one of the editors with me on the Encyclopedia of Women in Islamic Cultures. She serves as a member of the Advisory Committee of the Human Rights Council in Geneva. She's a founding member of Madad, a cultural initiative to support artistic and creative expressions. She's a member of the Cultural De Development Fund in Egypt, a member of the Advisory Board of the National Council of Translation in Egypt, and a member of the Board of Advisors of International IDA. She's also a member of the Advisory Committee of the Arab Reform Initiative, which is another research uh, institute. Um, she has uh, uh, served in uh, many capacities on, uh, on, uh, as uh, 
papers and, and uh, journal uh, editors, but I'm particularly interested in letting you know about some of her books. Uh, this year, a new book released, edited, which she edited with an introduction called Feminism in History. 2012, Gender, Nation, and the Arabic Novel, Egypt between 1892 and 2008. She edited in 2010 uh, a book, Mapping the Production of Knowledge in the Arab World. In 2007, uh, she did uh, a book on uh, girls in, uh, about uh, Hind El who was a very important leading feminist uh, in Egypt. Her list of books, which would take me another three to five minutes to read, is about a dozen books, uh, probably close to 100 journal articles. Uh, I'd really encourage you, you, you can easily access her actually on my webpage if you like, because as a member of the Arab Families Working Group and as a, a member of now the International Advisory Board of the Encyclopedia of Women uh, and Islamic Culture, she's on both of those pages. But if you were to Google her, you'd, you'd have to commit yourself to at least a day sitting watching the screen. So will you join me in this privilege of having Dr. Huda Lasada? her generosity and her friendship. Thank you, Sarah. So, my talk today, my title is Feminists Negotiate Power, the Battle Over the Egyptian Constitution. And I will engage directly or indirectly with some of the questions that occupy um, feminists in general and feminists in the Middle East in particular, regarding how best to achieve gender justice taking into consideration local and global contexts. So questions about rules of engagement with undemocratic states, for example, the limits and potential of state feminisms in dictatorships, questions that aim to understand and interpret moments of success, moments of failures. More recently, questions about losses or gains of women in the aftermath of the wave of Arab revolutions. Now, just to focus and to, get some, to have some coherence, I will share with you reflections and some insights on the constraints and potential of achieving or trying to achieve gender justice in a very specific political process, the writing of the Egyptian constitution endorsed in 2014. Commentaries and analysis of the Egyptian constitution, constitution in general, tend to emphasize the composition and the structure of the Constitution, and effectively stress intention, design, rationality, more than accident, evolution, and historical development. I'm quoting Nathan Brown here. I will focus not so much on the actual text or specific articles, but rather on the meta text, highlighting the evolution and historical development that guides the actual writing and also the process and the context as important indicators for understanding the dynamics of power and the workings of power structures. Through this exploration, I hope to shed light on the connection between content and context. Um, I also wish to contribute to debates on how women's rights, women rights activists negotiate with power with the aim of achieving gender justice, why or when they succeed or fail. Now, I will engage with these questions by focusing on the negotiations that took place around Article 11, or the, woman, the woman's article, as it is popularly known, in the 2014 Egyptian Constitution. I share these reflections from my position as a researcher specialized in gender studies, as a feminist with a history of engagement in women's rights movements in Egypt and the Arab world, and as a member of the 50 committee that drafted the 2014 Constitution. So I was a member of the Constitution Writing Committee and I'm trying to share my experiences. Now there's consensus amongst feminist circles that Article 11 is an achievement, a significant step in the right direction for women's rights in Egypt. It prescribes the state's commitment to ensuring equality between men and women, 
implementing positive discrimination measures to achieve equality, uh, ensuring access of women to public and senior management offices in the state and their appointment in judicial bodies and authorities from which they were barred uh, until, until now actually, and to combating violence against women. So this article is a rare example of a negotiation that actually worked. This is not to claim that the Constitution as a whole guarantees women's rights or rights in general, nor is it to say that this is a gender-sensitive Constitution, no. In fact, the 50 Committee did not succeed in doing a lot of things. For example, in including a constitutional provision to safeguard women a fair political representation in Parliament, i.e. quota. The negotiations resulted in both losses and gains. However, I do argue against the mechanical view that all political processes taking place under authoritarian regimes are necessarily engineered by an all-powerful regime, that concrete political gains are not possible, and when they do happen, they can be explained away as a gift from the ruling elite. I'm arguing against this view that these political gains, if they do happen under a dictatorship, are a trade-off or a coping mechanism of a resilient authoritarianism. My aim is to provide a more nuanced understanding of how feminist platforms interact with power, and I ask, can feminists engage with power despite authoritarian consolidation? What does the process look like? What are the terms of the battle? Now, I use power in this context to denote patriarchal domination enacted in the social and political spheres. Negotiations in the 50 Committee for drafting the Constitution in 2014 were not conducted on a level playing field against the backdrop, but, but against the backdrop of entrenched and deep-rooted unequal power relations. I will attempt to answer the question, so given the unequal power relations at the negotiating table, how did women's rights um, activists, how, how did the voices of women's rights activists achieve any leverage? Why did we succeed at this particular moment to include an article that championed women's rights in the Egyptian constitution? And why did we fail to specify a 20% quota, for example, for women representation in parliament, despite the fact that quota systems have been implemented in, in, in the Egyptian legal system many, many times and for different sectors in society. Now, for the gains in Article 11, I will argue that the, the three factors contributed to their achievement. The divisive politics of Islamism versus secularism, the internationalization of women and human rights discourse, and the new political spaces that opened up as a direct consequence of the 2011 revolutionary wave. For the failure to specify a quota, I argue that the resistance to inserting quotas in the constitutional text was due to the abuse of the quota system in Egyptian political history and the struggle over the control of the next parliament. First, I'd like to contextualize my discussion share with you some key points about the political environment at the moment of writing the Constitution in 2013. The legal context within which the 50 Committee operated and the historical context of Egyptian women's legal activism. So a bit of context first. The political context. All constitutions reflect the balance of power in society at a particular moment in history. In the Egyptian context, in 2013, the voice of feminists was not amongst the powerful contenders at the negotiating table. The moment was one of heightened political struggle and violence, fighting on the streets between protesters and security forces, a war against terrorist attacks, attacks in Sinai, the ethical trauma or hysteria after Rawa in August 2013, a comeback of old regime figures, a rise in a militarized nationalist discourse, a media campaign to vilify protesters and protests in general, and growing disenchantment of ordinary citizens with the very idea of revolution or change. Despite the acknowledged and visible participation of women in revolutionary movements for change, 
women have been conspicuously excluded from key political processes even in 2011. Um, I say even because in 2011 this was the moment when hopes and aspirations for meaningful changes in the body politics were very high. For example, there was not a single woman appointed in the committee established in March 2011 to amend the constitution. Women again were conspicuously excluded from several appointments made at the time. The dominant perception among policymakers was that women's rights advocates had no evident influence on women voters and were therefore not an effective pressure group to contend with. Having said that, the air, at the same time, the air was also laden with high expectations for significant sectors in society. The new constitution was the first step on the roadmap map agreed upon by the coalition that orchestrated the 30th of June 2013 revolt which led to the ouster of President Morsi and the beginning of a new political direction. For the many who marched against the rule of Islamists, the new constitution was meant to right the wrongs embodied in the Islamist 2012 constitution. We had two constitutions written since 2011. The first was in 2012, written by an Islamist majority uh, committee, and the second one written in end of 2013 and endorsed in 2014. The air was also filled with dreams of change and the promise of a better life for all. It is fair to say that there were strong doses of optimism in the midst of apprehension and overall fear for the future. The legal context. Now, in addition to the larger context, the textual starting point was also key in determining the direction and wording of many articles. The 50 committee was entrusted with modifying the 2012 constitution written by an Islamist majority. The starting point was a draft document produced by a committee of 10 experts who were commissioned by the 30th of June Alliance to rework the 2012 Constitution with the purpose of producing a working draft to support the work of the 50 Committee. Now, although the formal starting point of the 50 Committee was the working draft written by the Committee of Experts, the 2012 Islamist Constitution was the du jour document that was being revised and modified and constituted a key stumbling block. Why? The 2012 Islamist Majority Constitutional Assembly, in its attempt to take control of the state and society, resorted to two strategies. First, it inscribed the Constitution with language and introduced articles that worked towards the Islamization of society by making the state the guardian of morality, both in the public and private spheres. Second, it allocated privileges and powers, effectively bribes, to specific interest groups to garner their support and allegiance. The 50 Committee, I can, we can discuss this further later. The 50 Committee was forced to contend with interest groups who battled to retain the benefits gained in the previous constitution. It, it also struggled to minimize the theocratic character of the previous documents. So, from day one, the process was extremely complicated. Now, although the 50 Committee was tasked with the modification of the 2012 Constitution, as per the Presidential Declaration, the final outcome was actually a new text, consisting of 247 articles, 100, more than 100 of them not amended, 96 amended, and 46 new articles were added. Now, the Women, Legal Reform and Constitutions. I just want to give you a sense of how the legal struggle for, um, within Egypt has been really a very, very long battle. It goes back a long time in history. The women's movement in Egypt in the modern period dates back to the end of the 19th century when voices of women and men raised the issue of the necessity of improving women's position in society as a prerequisite for progress and development of the country. Now this was the heyday of British colonial expansion in the region and the women's movement, which took off under colonialism, has suffered from the challenges faced by many other women's movements struggling for gender justice under colonial exploitation. The liberation of women discourse carried the burden of guilt of colonialism 
and the failures and setbacks suffered by the nationalist independence movements. Women shouldered resp the responsibility of preserving the threatened traditions and identity of the colonized, and women's liberation movements continued to struggle with allegations and accu accusations of westernization and so on. Until today, the nationalist legacy of colonial guilt haunts women's rights activists as they continue to suffer from accusations of westernization and alienation uh, in their fight for rights and justice. Legal reform has been a defining hallmark of women's rights activism in Egypt and the Arab world from the early 20th century until the present day. So early feminists have all spoken up against legal discrimination against women. In 1956, after the revolution uh, of, the 1952, of 1952, led by the free officers in Egypt, Egyptian women gained the right to vote, equal opportunities in employment and education, and many benefits that significantly improved women's status in society and political life. However, the new reforms were emblematic of the nationalist ambiguity, what I, the legacy of colonial guilt vis-a-vis -vis women, as I like to describe it. The reforms did not touch the personal status laws, which resulted in a bizarre anomaly, where women enjoyed equal rights in the public sphere, but were totally subordinate to male members of their families in the private sphere. And the, and the, the good or bad example for this is that you can be a woman minister in government, a cabinet minister, but you cannot leave the country on an official uh, mission because your husband can actually stop you at the airport. And this is a true story, by the way, it's not made up. So in the 1970s, as more and more women consolidated um, their status in public, the stark discrepancy, I need to say that this rule was can I mean, husbands cannot stop their, 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 their um, Actually, they can. We'll talk about this later. It's okay. A bit of detail here. Okay. In the 1970s, as more and more women consolidated their status in public, the stark discrepancy between women's rights in the public and private spheres led to several initiatives to modify personal status laws. So, in, throughout the 20th century, women have been trying to do something about this. Many, many, many initiatives. But in the end, at the end of the 70s, there, was, there were several initiatives, but they never really made their way to Parliament, as, and they were always, because and the campaigners for women's rights were always subjected to very, very bitter campaigns uh, claiming to protect authentic family values from destruction and so on. However, in 1979, actually, a law was passed drawing on some of the proposals submitted earlier, and certain positive um, modifications were introduced, including a quota for women in Parliament. However, in 1984 and then later in 1986, the Constitutional Court um, ruled that these um, modifications were unconstitutional and they were um, cancelled. Now, um, when word got out about the possible annulment of Law 44, Diverse women's groups organized and launched a wide <coughs> campaign to counter the proposed amendments. And the committee was formed, the, def the Defense of Women and the Family was formed and held meetings uh, at Hoda Sharawi's organization. Hoda Sharawi is one of the prominent feminists in Egypt, pioneer feminist. And the committee was vilified in the media, subjected to a campaign of character assassination, and as accusations were hurled at its members, However, the committee succeeded in putting women's issues in the spotlight of public opinion. Uh, both the pressures exerted by the committee and the mobilization campaign, as well as the closeness of the Nairobi Women's Conference, resulted in the issuing of Law 100 in 1985 to replace the adult one. The new law consisted of articles very similar to Law 1979. However, compromises were made to appease the conservatives. Women activists were critical of these compromises and setbacks, but, and this is really the, the, the gist of the story, this battle over the law, over the constitution, breathed life in the women's movement and enabled the establishment of women's organizations that became very important in the following years.
Now, activism around constitutions and legal reform continued through the first decade of the 20th century, many, many details. I would like to just jump to March 2011. Immediately after the first revolutionary wave, women's groups in Egypt, who, who, I mean, as I say, we're, um, women's groups in Egypt are very conscious of legal reform and the importance of, of legal reform. So they immediately formed um, a, a committee, a group, to write our ideal constitution. So what is it that we would like to see in the new constitution uh, in 2011? Uh, and this also, and, and uh, the, the constitution was also used as an occasion to mobilize, to raise public awareness about women's rights and the challenges women face due to discrimination. So the Women in Constitution group was formed, began drafting constitutional articles to be ready to present once the process started. They issued statements, uh, drafted very specific articles, and, and so forth. Now, the, uh, this group, when the first Constitution Assembly right, uh, was formed in 2012, um, became very involved and interacted with this Assembly. They sent suggestions, they went to hearings, held meetings with members who also wrote opinion pieces, organized discussion forums. There was a lot of activity around the 2012 Constitution. But as I mentioned, the, the, um, this was an Islamist majority constitutional assembly, and the result for women was very unsatisfactory as the 100 member assembly were, were very biased, I have to say, against women's rights. Um, and in fact, there was no, and, and the, um, the article that talked about equality between men and women was deleted from the constitution in the 20th, there was no. Um, specific article that said that men and women were equal in 2012. Now, in 2013, the new committee was formed, and with other women's groups, this group interacted with the committee, and um, and the result was different. Now, I finish with my context. I would like to move to the analysis of the reasons which allowed for the passing of Article 11. As I mentioned, three factors. First, a liberal versus the, the liberal versus Islamist uh, struggle, or a liberal versus Islamist constitution. <clears throat> so why some things worked? I'll talk first about the gains. A constitutional commitment to safeguarding women's rights was absent from the 2012 constitution drafted by a constitutional assembly with an Islamist majority. The previous constitution of 1971 included Article 11, in which the state was committed to enabling women to perform their duties towards their families and their work in society, and to ensuring equality between men and women in the political, social, cultural, and economic spheres, while adhering to the principles of Sharia. This was the old article in 19 written in 1971. The 2012 Constitution annulled Article 11, the explicit, which, particularly the explicit commitment of the state to ensuring equality between men and women, and integrated the reference to women in the article about the family as the cornerstone of society. In the same article, the state is only committed to providing services to women in relation to their roles as mothers, and the, uh, to ensure the protection of female heads of households, divorced women, and widows. Now, as I mentioned, this assembly was uh, um, elected by an upper house, the Shura Council, which was again dominated by Islamists, and despite, and the Constitutional Assembly was also dominated by Islamists. The absence of an article that commits the state to ensuring equality between men and women was really one of the one just one example of the efforts of the 2012 assembly to fast track the islamization of both the state and society now they added the highly controversial article 2019 which potentially expanded the jurisprudence of sharia interpretations of civil laws they also added an article that increased the authority of al azhar in legislation and created a body of scholars of al azhar that had the power to oversee all matters related to Sharia. Ah. 
hence establishing for the first time a religious authority with powers over legislation. They added Article 44 that forbade insulting the prophets and messengers, and the section on rights and freedoms concludes with a statement that such rights and freedoms shall be practiced in a manner not conflicting with the principles pertaining to state and society included in Part 1 of the Constitution, meaning Sharia. The above constitutional stipulations raised alarm amongst civil society groups and large sections of society. I'm still talking about the 2012 Constitution. And amongst women in particular. There was a widespread feeling that women's rights were under attack and that many of the positive developments gained by women in the 20th century were going to be abrogated. Statements by Islamist preachers and leaders in the media, as well as members of the new Islamist elite, stoke these fears as they announced proposals to modify existing family laws. There was also the added fear of an Islamist future that was based on real and perceived shifts in the body politic. Now, an important characteristic of the 50-member Constitution Committee, the new committee formed in 2013, was that the majority of members identified themselves as liberals or pro-democracy advocates or secularists or socialists, in contradistinction to the majority of members in the 2012 Constitutional Assembly who identified with the project of political Islam. Now, all of the previous labors are controversial and the fault lines between them are fluid and ambiguous. I mean, I, I put that uh, up front here. But the point is that their self-identification, as well as the way they were perceived by society, was that they were non-Islamist. So they could be the most conservative people on earth, but they saw themselves as non-Islamist and secularist in that sense. Therefore, one of the goals of the said committee was to purge the constitution of the perceived incursions made by the Islamists to inscribe the Islamist political project onto the constitutional text. The most publicized example of this purge was the deletion of Article 219. The extent and meaning of this effort is again controversial and subject to a wider discussion. But what is certainly true, true is that there was consensus amongst members on the necessity of reinstating Article 11 and the commitment of the state to ensuring equality between men and women. This is not to say that the wording and content of the article was unanimously agreed upon or easily agreed upon, nor, to, nor is it to say that the 50 members were all champions of gender equality. Not all of them were, we have to remember that. In fact, the final outcome was the product of bitter struggles and compromises. Nevertheless, one of the important factors <coughs> that supported the approval of Article 11 by members of the committee was their self-identification as pro-women's rights in contradistinction to members of the Islamist Assembly. Championing, championing women's rights was yet again a marker of a liberal and modern identity the continuation of the modernist narrative of the Egyptian nation-state. Feminist researchers and activists have critiqued this modernist narrative and have highlighted the dangers of the politicization of women's rights issues. Nevertheless, it continues to be a dominant narrative that, in this case, worked for women. My second point is the internationalization of the rights regimes. Sylvia Wolby has argued that the last 20 years saw the integration of feminism in the international discourse of human rights with the emphasis on the responsibilities of states to protect those rights as a prerequisite for inclusion in the international regime of civilized states. In this international regime, the nation state, I'm quoting, has been the subject of successful pincer movement by feminists organized at both grassroots and transnational levels, unquote. Examining processes of political change in Egypt, Mona Obeshi starts with the same premise and has argued that the internationalization of the political regime in Egypt since the mid-1990s was a key factor that afforded activists and ordinary citizens unexpected political leverage in their asymmetric share of public power with the executive. This is particularly important within the context of an authoritarian regime. 
Elrobe she draws attention to the fact that despite the absence of democratic governance, um, the Egyptian state was a signatory to human rights conventions and the bilateral treaties which imposed international legal commitments and that integration in the international standard setting regime created a space for rights activists to use the concept of the rule of law to contest state violations of rights. Not only did Egypt sign international conventions, but one of the persistent tropes in the dominant discourse has been the necessity of safeguarding the image of Egypt. A narrative about an imagined, civilized and modern state, as well as an important player in international politics. The reality of the internationalization of Egyptian politics, plus the projected self-image of a modern state, afforded rights activists disproportionate powers vis-à-vis -vis state representatives in international forums as they invoked the standards of the rule of law to challenge violations and argue for rights. The endorsement of the internationalization of rights was another marker that distinguished the 15-member Constitution Committee from its predecessor. The 2014 Constitution introduced an article that emphasized Egypt's adherence to international human rights conventions. Now again, the article was subjected to heated debates, but it was finally approved with a majority vote. Um, so discussions of Article 11 and women's rights definitely benefited from this direction amongst members, since women's rights were an integral part of rights discussions and the membership of Egypt in the international community. Third point, opening up of new political spaces post 25th of January 2011. The revolutionary wave that swept Egypt in 2011 opened up new spaces for challenging dominant power structures and dominant authoritarian discourses with varying degrees of success. I argue that the text in Article 11 that commits the state to protecting women against all forms of violence is a direct consequence of post-2011 activism which culminated in passing a law that directly criminalized sexual harassment of women. Campaigns to raise public awareness on issues related to violence against women in both the public and private spheres started as early as the 1990s, with the work of a number of women's organizations, notably in Nadim, the New Woman Foundation, and the Center for Egyptian Women Legal Assistance. However, the issue was repeatedly swept under the carpet and, the status of, and had the status of a social and political taboo. Discussions of incidents of violence against women in public forums were mostly drowned by arguments that blamed women for the assaults because they were either not dressed properly or they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Domestic violence was even more of a taboo as religious arguments were manipulated to justify violence against women in the family. It was only after the mass, mass protests in 2011 that sexual harassment and assault on women became the subject of public media debates. At the end of 2012 and start of 2013, incidents of sexual assaults against women present in large protests were reported. Activists recognized the problem and responded by organizing groups that would intervene to help women who were assaulted in public spaces. So there was Basma, uh, meaning imprint, was founded in June 2012. Shuf Taharush, I saw harassment, was founded in October 2012. Op Antij, Operation Anti-Harassment, and Tahrir Bodyguard were established in November 2012. The new groups, together with already, uh, the new groups, together with already established activist groups working on violence against women, notably Nazra, for example, succeeded in raising media and public awareness of the extent and scale of the problem. Now, these groups formed rescue groups that intervened to save women from attacks. They provided survivors with psychological and legal aid, offered self-defense classes, collected stories of women who suffered assaults, pressured new political parties and civil society actors to recognize the problem unequivocally. January 2013 marks a turning point in the status of the issue of sexual violence against women as a matter for public debate, when survivors of attacks felt empowered to talk about their experience in public and on live TV.
together with the efforts of the anti-sexual harassment support groups, or possibly as a direct result of the said efforts, these powerful public testimonials of women broke the taboo that inhibited discussions of the issue. In June 2014, an anti-sexual harassment decree was passed, imposing harsh sentences on offenders. It is noteworthy that the conservative discourse on violence against women, putting the burden of responsibility on women, was not invoked in discussions by members of the 50 Committee. This was not amongst the contentious issues in Article 11. Worthy of note is that the issue of violence was presented in a generic manner with no attempt in discussions to highlight distinctions between public and private and domestic violence. Women's role in the revolutionary wave was cited repeatedly as evidence of the worthiness of women and the importance of committing the state to ensuring substantive rights as well as taking measures to protect them from violence directed against them as women. Violence against women as women and the necessity of combating it had become part of dominant public discourses in the aftermath of January 2011 and this can be counted as one of the unequivocal gains of the revolutionary movement. Now, I want to give you, um, we still have 10 minutes, so I, I would like to give you a sense of a battle lost. So, I've been talking about what worked. In this section, I would like to examine why no quota for women was specified in the 2014 Constitution as an example of a loss. First, um, it is important to bear in mind the following considerations are in quotas in the world in, ge in general, because this is a much discussed topic. Now, quotas are conceived as a measure of positive discrimination or affirmative action that compensate for or make amends for or redress historical exclusion and marginalization of a particular group in society. Gender quotas are part of a new type of equality policy representing a shift from equal opportunity to equality of results. I'm quoting. A quick look at the international scene reveals that over 100 countries have used different types of quota systems to enable women, women's access to different houses of representatives. Having said that, quotas for women is a controversial topic even among feminists. There's no agreement there. It intersects with key debates in feminist theory and political science about the necessity and effectiveness of women's political participation. Regarding women's political participation, we can single out two key approaches, the fast-track approach and the incremental approach. Advocates for the incremental approach recognize discrimination against women and their lack of resources, but believe that the situation will improve as society develops. Advocates for the fast-track approach are in favor of gender quotas. They emphasize the unequal power relations in society as a key to the exclusion of women. The Platform for Action approved at the 4th UN World Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995 marks a discursive shift as regards women's political participation, from women are not equally represented in politics due to their lack of resources and will, to women are excluded due to existing unequal power relations. So here the onus is on the states, on political elites, to redress the balance of power and so forth. <clears throat> Parliament was not an issue with the principle of quotas, as is the case in other contexts. 
The Egyptian electoral history has allowed for different types of quotas since the 1960s. At this particular moment, the 50 committee, in fact, approved a 25% quota for women in local councils, for example. The argument for gender quota in local councils uh, was not framed as an equality of result measure, but as capacity building of future generations of politicians and social activists. More importantly, local councils, despite their importance in their overall political scene, were not regarded as central to the power, to the power base of aspiring political elites. Representation in parliament, the locus of power and rule was another matter. So why is it that all these quota discussions did not succeed? I, uh, there are two reasons that I put forward. The troubled legacy of quota systems implemented in Egypt and the fight over the electoral system and control of the next part. So quotas in Egypt have a very complicated legacy. A discussion of gender quotas in Egypt necessarily collides with two very troubled legacies. The uneven history of gender quotas since 1979 and the 50% quota for workers and farmers enforced since 1964. In 1979, a law was passed allocating 30 out of 360 seats in parliament to women. Women's representation in parliament was between 8 to 9% until 1986 when the quota law was struck down by the Supreme Constitutional Court and women's representation plummeted to 2%. In 2009, the law was amended, 64 seats were added to the total number of seats in Parliament, but these were 64 seats that only women were allowed to compete for. Now, the gender quota for women has been subject of bitter disputes, many throughout history. It revived discourses about Western-oriented women elites alienated from their societies and guided by Western agenda. It breathed life in traditional patriarchal prejudices and discriminatory gender discourse about the place of women and their primary roles as mothers, etc. Analysts and researchers have also argued that women MPs have not been effective in passing laws and that they have invariably consolidated the hold of the National Democratic Party, which was the ruling party over Parliament. The same analysts, however, did not necessarily comment on the effectiveness of male MPs, nor on the consolidation of the control of, of the NDP on Parliament. The point, of course, is that it is not really possible or fair to attempt an assessment of the role of women MPs in Parliament in a dictatorship defined by bad governance and corrupt political processes. Another troubled legacy of quotas in Egypt was the existing and highly controversial 50% quota for farmers and workers. Now this was a provision passed by the Nasserist regime and aimed to ensure the representation of marginalized sectors in society. However, the provision had long lived its intended function and was abused by successive regimes in order to manipulate parliamentary procedures and decision making. This provision was struck down by vote in the 50 committee. However, some members of the committee lobbied for a transitional article that would keep in place the 50% quota for workers and farmers for the next round of elections. So the attempt to insert a quota for women collided with the champions of a quota for farmers and workers, as quotas became a site for contestation over which sector or group will gain privileges that would facilitate representation in Parliament. So finally, the last point, electoral systems and the control over the next parliament. Determining quotas for women or any other marginalized group in society would inevitably influence the electoral system. One of the tasks required of the 50 committee was to discuss and outline the electoral system for the next house of parliament. Um, the choices of the table were a proportionate representation system, a single member district system or a mixed system that combined both systems. Political parties, especially the main new parties established after the 25th of January revolution, all agreed that a 100% proportionate representation system was the best way forward. The current leadership, the decision makers, with some parties and groups in support were in favor of a single member district system. Reasons are very highly debatable. 
Relevant point here is that quotas are possible and easier to implement in a proportionate representation system, and much more difficult to implement in a single member district system. Hence, all those in favor of a single member district system were vehemently opposed to specifying quota percentages, even if they were not necessarily prejudiced against the principle of quotas for women. In this respect, discussions about quotas which got mixed up with very real power struggles over the system of rule and about which party or group will win the next round of parliamentary elections. Okay, so I will conclude. Um, so just a word to conclude. Uh, just to say that negotiations over constitutional articles were often arduous, contentious, bitterly contested. Political gains and losses are important to identify, I think, and to understand in terms of their microdynamics as part of the ongoing struggles for women and human rights activists. I have tried to argue that some gains were possible, even if the larger picture looks very difficult. Um, and as a member of the 50 committee, the drafted the constitution, and party to negotiations over many articles, I have tried to share insights uh, that I gained in the process, hoping to contribute to feminist debates about the possibilities and limitations of negotiating with power. Thank you.